Bismillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah My dear brothers and my sisters Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran has made it explicitly clear that the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that of Ar-Rahmah. Ar-Rahmah is mercy which translates to the nearest meaning in English mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ which in the meaning translates to the nearest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a mercy, a rahmah to the worlds and this includes every single human out there. So in our quest to take this mercy to mankind, people do take different roads to take Islam to people. But there is a very clear-cut difference between how we do it today and how our predecessors have done it in the past. For example, in the days of old, Muslims preached the oneness of Allah first, then followed uh, by the abiding laws and the halal and the haram. But uh, today, we do actually the opposite. When we want to call someone or preach Islam to somebody, we always start by selling the rules first. So that uh, the person, or we seduce people into accepting the rules first, and then for them to accept the maker or the master of these rules. For example, when we give da'wah to the non-Muslims, or when we call the non-Muslims to Islam, we first start talking about the rights of women in Islam. The, we start depicting all the evil thoughts that they have first only to get to the point of who is Allah and why we should worship him and so on and so forth and obviously the way we do it is absolutely wrong the difference between the two different approaches is that when the person accepts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first everything else that follows becomes acceptable but when the person accepts the rules first, then everything else becomes secondary. This is why many converts today, they come to Islam, and then they will revert back to how they were before Islam in a split of a time. Many Muslims are having difficulties with how to take a new Muslim as soon as they embrace Islam. How can we take them to the next level? Plainly and simply because the next level does not exist. That next level is where there is the spirit of the community. And this, my dear brothers and my sisters, does not exist nowadays. It's purely individuality all the way through until the end of time. This morning's pep talk is not about how to give dawah, how to call people to Islam, because this is not what is of importance to me today. Because when we speak to non-Muslims about Islam, we always make things seem that it's, everything is perfect. Just come to Islam and that's it. You will have an awesome life. They were told Islam has love, only to find a cold, icy, individualistic, me, 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 my group, my sheikh, and certainly no true love. Deception number one, many people leave Islam after finding out the true reality. They were sold Islam has equality in it. No racism, no class, unity is in abundance. Only for them to find that once you enter Islam, you are in isolation. You are classified and are going through a character assassination. We make sure your pre-Islam life is completely destroyed. That is deception number two. People before embracing Islam, they have their emotions, their views, their rights, their entity only when they embrace Islam, they fall into a grip, a very rusty, hard grip of de-emotionalization, i.e. we take away emotions from people, where people do unto you and you just cry in the depth of the night. No one will come to their rescue or to your rescue, you are alone. Suddenly, when you come to Islam, or today's Islam, in our lousy Islam, your views must submit to whoever you follow. Your views are wrong till they are proven correct or validated by some of the important sheikhs. Suddenly, what you think is not authentic, it's not clear, it's not beautiful, until somebody else before you has said it. There is no individuality. Many people before they come to Islam, 
who are great people into thinking and everything. But as soon as they walk into the Islam that we have manipulated today, they lose all their rights. Their rights are taken away from them, all in the name of a religion that came to set them free. It's sad to really say that these and many, many other issues are driving more converts out of Islam than bringing new Muslims in. The responsible, you and me, and our crooked way of thinking. You might say, no, I'm not thinking like that. But by you keeping quiet and letting criminals out there in the name of Islam, poisoning the pure air of Islam without you telling anything or stopping them, then you are an accomplice, and so I am if I am not doing what I am supposed to do. But this is again not what I want to talk about today. Today, it no longer is enough to be just a Muslim. We have to add an extra layer on top of that. We have to be a moderate Muslim, an extremist Muslim, a Salafi Muslim, an Ikhwan Muslim, as this Muslim and that Muslim. No longer are we Muslims enough for us to be just a Muslim. And this is a cancerous disease that is eating right in the heart of every single cell that makes the Muslim nation. So as you can see, Islam is no longer that pure religion that was at the time of Rasulullah In fact, Islam today is points of views of this and that. Add to this 1400 years of different opinions and you end up with a completely different dish than how it was at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu Is it possible to live that kind of Islam? Of course it is. Is it possible to be just like the Sahaba or that era? Of course it is not. They are different and we are different. This is a completely different time. We are the 21st century. Now I want to speak about a side of Islam that has caused us grief a lot of grief that we are living today and this is the macho understanding of islam the cold and piercing reality that we muslims are paying a heavy heavy price is that our family conduct rules marriage family laws women and men's status in islam have all been decided and written and decided and deeply rooted in all Muslims' hearts and souls by the guys only. Women had never, ever had any input in Islam. This is a very scary thought, believed or not. Someone might say, no, hang on, hang on. There is Umuna Aisha, there is this companions. I will tell you, yes, you are correct. But even the wives of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were scholars. And even if they taught to men, Today, they are just treated as carriers of the hadith only. Hardly ever they would, the male gender would go against a point of view. For example, if Umm Aisha says that is okay and the, the other guys would say no, hardly ever you would find that someone would side with what Umm Aisha radiallahu anha has said. This is scary. This is absolutely scary. Now I want to take you in a small journey, a little journey here about how the fiqh, how the understanding of Islam was done. As I said, it's 99.99% male dominated. It's man who has made the law. This is one. Two, it was written under political influences. And believe me, a lot of the problems that we're going through here today is because of the political choices that have been made in the early days. And that is after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm speaking more precisely at the time of the Dawla al-Umawiyah when the Umawi uh, state was erected and then the Abbasi people when Islam was really written 300 years after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as I said, this is a male and it was written also in a state of strength when Muslims were strong. So this is where the understanding of Islam was written. When our scholars have de debated issues about the male and the female and the family and the matrimony and all that kind of stuff, they never ever thought that Muslims would become weak again as we are today. They didn't define anything to do for us when we are weak. They only spoke when Muslims are strong what it is they do. This is why we've gone through a lot of problems today is because many people today Muslims are acting on laws that were written by strong people 
and the contrast is, as you can see, as devastating as it is today. Anyway, women, as I said, did not have a big say in the fiqh of Islam. Even issues that are relating to women only, like menstruation and things like that, were debated by men only. Even though Rasulullah did consult his wives, and it is clear and apparent that Rasulullah did call upon women in matters that relate to women. But we, our scholars, didn't call on women. And all the books is, as you can see, it's a Hanafi, it's Hanbali, it's Maliki and Shafi, it's this man, that man, this man, that man, this man, that man. So much so that so many of what we say to the world that Islam came to liberate women is an absolute great lie. We kind of like tell the world what it wants to hear but once the world comes into islam they find some scary realities take this one ask any scholar about what islam has given women and they will tell you well allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded muslims to respect the mothers and that islam honored the wives and daughters Islam has stopped men from burying their... They will say like a majority of the things that you know day in, day out. But when you walk into the books of fiqh of Islam, you will find a staggering reality. Al-Quran completely isolated from reality. And it's the more the things of the scholars that are prevalent that take priority. For example, Ibn al jawzi or it's the school of thoughts today, what they say, when a woman marries a man or becomes the wife of a man, she becomes like a prisoner of war to the man. And what does a prisoner of war have? And these books are translated into English. For example, I'll give you another one. In our fiqh, Islamic fiqh, either Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi, all the scholars agree that as long as a girl has not reached the age of puberty, her father can marry her to any other man and the girl has no saying at all in the equation. You know what that means? Your husband can take your three years old daughter or four or five or six or seven or eight, nine or ten, whatever it is, before she reaches the age of menstruation, before she comes puberty or teenage or whatever. He can marry her unto another man. Why did they come up with this one? To justify the marriage of Rasulullah to our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, who was six. But then again, six is not the only opinion. There are other scholars that say that our mother Aisha did not marry Rasulullah SAW when he was six and he didn't sleep with her when she was nine. In fact, they said he married her, some of them even say when she was 18. I will make a talk about this some other time so you can hear the other side of the coin. So there you go. So now we have this thing here. Another saying also of our scholars of uh, you women, you will hate this one here. When a man marries more than a woman, when he has two or three or four, the majority of Muslims, what is written in our books of fiqh about the rights of the wives and how the man is equal, you will scratch your head about how much power the man has and how extremely little power the woman has in saying whatsoever in that matter. So much so that if you are a woman, you would actually despise getting married in every way. And obviously this is what the scholars say. What Islam says is something else. What Islam says is something else. For example, I'll give you another example here. And this is where I want to really, my point that I want to speak about is when your daughter gets married. What to expect from marriage today? How, what, what would you expect from a culture about matrimonial laws, family laws written by men for the advantage of men? In a stage where every man was debating the issue of marriage between men, it is already one-sided issue. No woman has a say about matrimony at all. We all know that a woman cannot be married against her own uh, choice. If she doesn't want to marry somebody, she won't, right? It's, it's fact. But if she is a, a young girl, then she has no right at all. You, all you have to do is just marry her to the man. He takes her home. She cries. She doesn't cry. She does whatever she does. She's got... And this is like so painful to even speak about it. But uh, again, when you marry your daughter, that's the quickest way to lose your daughter today if her husband has got this kind of macho understanding. Never forget 
that we always say that Islam came to honor women, right? And you ladies, when you are asked about a non-Muslim, oh, I wear hijab because it makes me pride, it gives me dignity, blah, 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 and all these nice uh, uh, sugar-coating sayings, okay? But the reality of it is this. When you are in the depth of the cultural Islam, not the Islam preached by the Quran and not the Islam preached by Rasulullah and not the Islam lived by the Sahaba. I'm talking about the 300 and up to our time Islam, the, 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 the mainly cultural, colored Islam. They will tell you, they will discuss issues. Who has got more rights uh, than the other, husband or wife? Then they mention texts to support their arguments. So you will hear a scholar, they say, the rights of the husband, and then he will bring like so many ahadith. Okay, but he will not be able to bring uh, ayat from the Quran, except a few little things here and there, but they, they are not rights, they are more of status. But they will bring an endless number of hadith why the man has got more rights than the wife. And then when they speak about the mother, they will speak, uh, bring again lots of evidences to justify that women, mothers in Islam, have more rights than husbands, than fathers. And you start scratching your head, hang on. In the previous talk you said men have got more rights, now it's women who has got more rights? Okay, how do I reconcile between the two? And then they say, ha ha, hang on. You as a child, who should you be more respectful towards? Your mother? mother or your father, you all know your mother, your mother, your mother. So 75% for the mother, 25% for the father. So if it's 75 to 25%, what do we do with the ayat in the Quran where Allah commands us to be just to both parents equally? And it's now people will start turning right and tossing and jumping and bumping and whatever. But what are we going to do with the Quran that says equality? Hey, there you go. This is another issue. And then they will bring another issue. Who should the parents be more respectful or obey? The husband or the parents? And here where we lose our children to a very sick and ill understanding. Instead, in Muslim world, subhanAllah, I really hate this reality. Really hate it with everything in my bones. When you marry your daughter to a man, or you bring a young daughter to your family, you marry her to your child. Don't you ever, never, ever waste your time or teach your child that he must break the woman to obey him. This is a psychopathic, this is a pervert schizophrenic mentality that has rubbed on Muslims today. Every time, most of the problems that I have dealt with in my years with Muslim couples that where the marriage has broken, it always is. As soon as the husband marries the woman, he is on a mission to break the personality of the woman to morph her into her, his own liking. He turns her into a ring, she dances to his tunes, she washes his clothes, she does every single thing that what he wants. She no longer becomes a human, she becomes his slave. And not only that, she becomes the slave of his mother, his family, and if she lives in the family, then she becomes the maid of the entire family. She must cook, she must, she must, she must, she must, she must. Is this the Islam that Allah has preached in the Quran? Is this the Islam that Rasulullah has preached? Absolutely not. But but our books of fiqh and hadith are polluted with such nonsense. You know what? Today, the very first thing when the daughter marries, what, they, what she's being taught is that your husband is your hellfire or your paradise. It's how you treat your husband. And then if the father says something, the father has absolutely nothing. So I have educated my daughter for 22 years. I have bled. I didn't sleep night. I worked and I did and her mother did, 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 did. And then one day we marry her to somebody. The next day we actually do not exist. It's 100% obedience to the husband. This is crazy. Even in a religion of the cows, they don't have these stupid laws. They don't. Allah in Al-Quran has linked his obedience and he has spoken about obeying him and right after it the obedience of the parents there is not one single ayah in Al-Quran where it says the woman must obey the, the husband and let down the parents so why is we Muslims why are we Muslims today doing exactly the opposite of Al-Quran and watch the problems that we are going to go through today and what we are facing today I know personally 
Some daughters that have married and they turned against the parents, against her father. Why? Because her husband doesn't agree, doesn't like her father. Brainwashed, she doesn't like her father anymore. She doesn't even call him. She doesn't visit him. Six, seven years, she never invited him once to her home to have a dinner properly. What do you think of that? And that is the husband, long bearded, mashallah, and he knows the Quran, knows the hadith, and things like that. Why seek understanding? How can you turn a child against their parents? How, 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 how? Where is the equality of Islam? Where is being thankful to the people that have done good? The wife that you are enjoying today is the byproduct of those parents that you today are enemy with. My dear brothers and my sisters, I warn you, I warn you, I warn you. Concentrate on gaining the love of your partner, not breaking her to obey you. If a man asks a woman to obey him because he is weak, obedience is not something. I don't think Rasulullah as soon as he got married to his women, he had the next day a pep talk. Okay, lady, I'm your husband and from today you must obey me. What I say runs and what I don't say doesn't go. If you, that is your thinking, you actually need to sit down properly and have a brain wash. Honestly, take your mind, put it in a washing machine, add extra uh, detergent and add some alcohol so that it disinfects your brain. Wash it well, put it back in your brain and inshallah it will all go back to time to work properly. Why should you lose your child when you marry them? Why should you lose your grandchildren when you marry your child? Why? What, what is your punishment? Why should you have to choose between your partner and your parents? Why? The non-Muslims, subhanAllah, they have better relationships. We always laugh at them, ha ha ha, family breakage, ha ha ha. But you know what? We Muslims are going through the same family breakage. And what makes it worse is ours is in the name of Islam. I lose my daughter in the name of Islam. You lost your daughter, it's in the name of Islam. They take, why? Because the other family thinks, well, as soon as a daughter comes to them, she is an inferior creature. Their child is a macho man. It's him who runs the family. It's him, it's him, it's him. He must decide. I know of a lot of couples where the wife has done her head and her teeth to help the husband. And guess what? His family is still not satisfied with her because she is a woman. He is a man. And that same family wouldn't accept the same thing for their own daughter if she marries another man. My dear brothers and my sisters, we have to understand this reality. For 20 years, we educate our children to respect their parents, to obey us, to honor us. We teach them the Quran and the Sunnah and all the status of the parents. Only when they get married, they are brainwashed into hating us. What is the problem? It's painful. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't put your child in this situation. This is why I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to prepare your child for this emotional abuse. For this, and also another thing, if your husband tells you not to divulge what happens in the home and you are abused, he has built a safe where he can abuse you and no one out there in the world would know. So many women of you, maybe you are one of you, you're listening to my talk and you know your marriage is in big, deep trouble, yet you put a smiley face out there, everything is going fine. I feel sorry for you. I totally feel sorry for you. How can you tell the world that Islam came to liberate women when you are abused in the name of Islam? Don't let the male macho crazy society dominate. Islam is in great danger, not because of the attacks of the non-Muslims. It's because of the way Islam has been run. A woman is like a prisoner of war. This is in our books of fiqh. A woman cannot do as she please. They even debate. We tell people that a woman control her money. If you could only read in our books of fiqh, and that's why in Saudi Arabia, the scholars of Saudi Arabia, that's why they get this, that a woman cannot run her own finances by herself. Some of them, they even debate, she can only run a third of her money. Completely rubbish. 
completely rubbish. The other day, one of these uh, pro Saudis thinking it's scary. Uh, they must be banned from England. He said women in England must not uh, be allowed. It's haram on women, uh, Muslim women in England to drive because they must stay at home. This is sick. This is absolutely sick. And that is the Islam that we are telling to the world. With the Muslim, uh, with the non-Muslim, come to Islam. Islam is beautiful. Islam liberates women. The rights of women in Islam. Only when you become a Muslim, you will see that <laughs> you have no rights. You become a slave. You become a slave. This is an eye-opening. I will talk more about these topics here because we have to stop these idiocies and we have to stop these lies. Islam can do very well without these lies. Again, I will tell you one thing, my dear brothers and my sisters. Prepare yourself for the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. We are going to be attacked by so many professional people that will bring the little tiny bits of contradictions in Islam that exist. And believe me, they do exist a lot. The only one that does not have contradictions in it is Al-Quran. Everything there is there. We have more contradictions in Islam than Jewism and Christianity together. That's why we have the difference of opinion. Do you think, how come it's one prophet, one God, one rule, and you have 600 sayings about an issue? It's headaches. Headaches, headaches. It's a sick disease that we are going through today. Watch how many Muslims groups today. We even have a police. The Salafi people have appointed themselves as the police of Islam. It's who they say is Muslim is Muslim. And he who is not, who they say is Muslim is not. This is sick. This is a disease. This is a problem that we are facing. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we wake up before it's too late. Because soon we will regret a lot of what we are doing today. Do not abuse your children. Do not abuse the wife of your child. And do not let your daughter abused in the name of Islam. So many kids have been lost already. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would help us stop this crime that is committed in the name of his religion. One day we will tell people come to Islam and they will tell you what? Do you want me to come to your religion where I become your prisoner of war? Are you kidding me? Do you want me to come to a religion where my daughter is six years old? You can marry her to ever you want to and, I, and the kid has no say at all? Is that the religion you want me to come to? No, thank you very much indeed. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and after him the Sahaba always, always called to the belief in Allah. They didn't sell them rights of women in Islam. When I, Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa, I can bring you thousands upon thousands of texts that take every right of a woman in the name of Islam written by macho man of Islam. We're good at lying. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. I really do. Wa salli Allahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this pep talk will help your eyes at seeking and understanding the Quran because our safety, our safeguard, and our immunity is in Al Quran and the very authentic Sunnah that doesn't contradict Al Quran. وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله To be part of my group just send me a message on WhatsApp on 07876408735 السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته